Good evening and welcome to the British Library. To those of you who are, have either been here since uh, 11 o'clock this morning, which seems probably seems an awful long time ago, but hopefully it's been a great day for you. Um, all those of you who just arrived, uh, nice to see you as well. Obviously this ex uh, event is part of a series today, but accompanying the British Library exhibition, Fantasy Realms of Imagination, which runs until the end of uh, February. So please do get a chance to see that if you can. And do check out some of the upcoming events, uh, everything from sessions with Alan Moore and Susanna Clarke, uh, talks on Ursula Le Guin, on um, Angela Carter, uh, many, many more sessions to come. So please do check out the programme. So this session, uh, last but not least, we have two fantastic uh, writers uh, joining us on stage today, uh, talking about worlds building in fantasy from lots of different perspectives, not only in their own work, but also so uh, in, in all kinds of genres besides. Um, you, as you know, we have Adrian Tchaikovsky here tonight. We were due to have Aliette de Baudard, uh, who wasn't able to make it from uh, over uh, for this event at the end, but we had a fantastic replacement, uh, the one and only Ellen Kushner, who's currently resident in Europe, normally based in the US, um, uh, who has a huge, uh, amazing track record as a writer uh, and, and as a critic and many things besides. They'll be talking to Matthew Sangster, who is a co-curator, or he's a guest curator, Curator on the British Library Exhibition uh, Fantasy. He is co-director of the uh, Glasgow University Centre of for Fantasy and the Fantastic, which sounds pretty fantastic. And um, he was also the author of this year's book, uh, An Introduction to Fantasy. So uh, many, many credentials. So please welcome our speakers to the stage. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen would like it to be known that she does not consider herself a critic, but in criticising John's introduction, she just made herself <laughs> one. So. I didn't say I was uncritical. <laughs> okay. Um, I will introduce our authors, although I'm sure they need no introductions uh, to this audience. So, Adrian Tchaikovsky is the author of, I think, about 35 fantasy novels at this point, something along those lines, or oh, fantasy and science fiction. We're up to 50. Up to 50. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, <laughs> including the Shadows of the Apt series, the Echoes of the Fall series, the Children of Time science fiction series, and Fatal Architecture. His new series is The Tyrant Philosophers, uh, City of Last Chances, I've just read. It's an incredible book. And the new one, House of Open Wounds, is, I think, available outside. I've not had the chance to read that, but Adrian may tell us about it later. He's also the author of a, a large range of novellas and short stories. My particular favourite is Elder Race, which I really recommend to you. If you've not read, that's an incredible book. Um, and Ellen Kushner is probably best known to you as the author of the Riverside series, Swords Point, Privilege of the Sword, and Fall of Kings, which she wrote with her wife, Dila Sherman, who is also here somewhere, I think. Um, she's also the author of to a wonderful book called Thomas the Rhymer, which, again, I would really recommend to you, which is featured in the exhibition. Um, you've got her original working notes alongside the burnt manuscript of an early version <laughs> Thomas the Rhymer, from, the, from the fire in the 18th century, which destroyed quite a lot of English heritage. They shouldn't have kept those in somewhere called Ashburnham House. Um, <laughs> Ellen is also a radio performer and a creator of audio dramas and has many other exciting strings to her bow, which we will get into. But let's begin with a sort of more general question about, um, about the encounter with world building. I was just wondering whether you would both be happy to say something about the first time you remember really being drawn into another fantasy world, it's not one of the first things you read um, that, that did that thing where you feel like, oh, hang on, I'm not in the space that I recognise. I'm in somewhere entirely different. Adrian, do you want to? Um, so, it's very obscure. There's a book called The Seven Times Search by a German writer called Paul Beagle, uh, which I read when I was very young. And it was kind of a portal fantasy, I guess. The, the main character gets shrunk to a very small size and thrown in the garden, where he encounters, as will surprise no one, a range of insects and other creatures. Ah. Um, <laughs> and there was this whole world, this sort of society amongst and between the insects. And it was, I think, whilst I'd read, I'd read a lot of Doctor Who mm -hmm. and I'd probably read the Narnia books by then, that was the first time where I just ran into something that there's a whole world going on. It's not even particularly the story of the book, but the world that underlies everything that happens has been thought through and built up. 
colleagues. Alan, do you have a, a similar experience? Or? Yeah, I actually wanted to think about the mm. ones I encountered that didn't have it in mm. Why Not. Like, mm. I mean, things that were fantasy but were not other worlds. I was obsessed with uh, the original Peter Pan, but that was its own enclosed narrative. Um, Alice in Wonderland, I never particularly liked because it didn't feel like a real world. Mm. And um, actually, the first book I ever remember uh, being read was James Thurber's The Thirteen Clocks, uh, which is a takeoff on fantasy. Uh, I took it very seriously, but again, it didn't feel like another world. And then I'm thinking, well, fairy tales were the first thing that I was told, I mean, before I could read, and they felt like, like somewhere else that you could maybe get to. I guess I'm sort of echoing C.S. Lewis here. And then I read the Narnia books. I mean, once I learned to read, the first Narnia book came to me pretty quickly. And that was that moment of aha, and not only that it existed and could you know, had been created, but that you could physically go to it if you're in the book, as well as mm. as read about it. That was kind of a double whammy. Mm. So in some ways, the portal better than the like world that's entirely independent. This is not yeah. only another place, but another place in which there is a plausible means that one might <laughs> one I mean, might travel. Tell me, you you weren't always looking in the back of a wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> several several volunteers there for a for a Narnia mission in the audience. Um, with your so. With your own works, how do you, do you get to the point where you realise that to tell the story as you wanted to, you needed and you needed a world in which to set them? What was the, what was the sort of, what was the sort of impetus for some of the worlds in your works? Um, so I came to writing from a role-playing games mm. uh, sort of hobby, mm. and in role-playing games, when you're the games master, you are building worlds from the get-go, and specifically you are building them for other people to experience, mm. and that led very, very smoothly into, by way of reading the Dragonlance books and seeing that kind of bridge from games to novels, uh, into thinking, I could, I could do this uh, in prose, I could do this as, as, a, as a writer. So there is an enormous skill set you can develop just from the gaming side of things, mm. uh, with worlds and with characters, that translate into writer skills very easily. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's I mean, that's one of the nice things about fantasy in general. I think it sort of it begins to show you how to do things very early, like and the transfers into rule sets, and then the rule sets transfer back into other kinds of other kinds of narratives. So, is this the background to Shadows of the Apt? Did that begin as a world? That so Shadows, yeah, Shadows of the Apt was many years before it was ever mm. written up as books. Was a, um, a role playing campaign I, I ran. Um, I, mean, I think the other the other the other part of that particular equation is. When you are doing a world for an adventuring party, you make it a very robust world and you explore it in all sorts of directions that the story wouldn't need necessarily go because you can't control where the players will take it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very good practice for making a nice, immersive, complete feeling world um, when, you're, when you're writing it for a book. Mm. No, I think that's, yes. That sort of sense that your characters could go in all sorts of directions, but they will not fit necessarily because they're characters. So in some ways, more relaxing perhaps than dealing with players. Or, or um, <laughs> I quite like the idea that my characters are also going to wrong foot me mm. and just go off to places they weren't <laughs> supposed to, and I will just have to follow after them with a notebook and record what happens to them. So. Oh dear, <laughs> critical failure there. Oh, hang on. This is... Ellen, how about you with, with Riverside? Where did the seeds for that? This is a wonderful uh, little discussion because I represent the loyal opposition. Mm. <laughs> I absolutely start with my people and just follow them around. Mm. And will occasionally tweak things to make sure that the plot works by, by figuring uh, what sort of culture is going to allow this thing to happen. Um, and it, particularly in the Swords Point, in the first book, I had the characters and I, and I kind of, you know, <laughs> encountered them in the bedroom and left from there and <laughs> wandered around and, and knew there was much more to the city than I was describing in that novel, but all I needed to see was what they saw. And mm. uh, any time a new character popped in and saw something, we saw that as well. And that was all I needed to write, to write the book. Mm. Um, it's also interesting because for me, I hope this isn't too tangential. Fairy tales were so appealing to me as a kid, and I knew that they both were and were not another world. They were they were sort of the in-between place. That was sort of the world we lived in, sort of not. I was fortunate enough to have my dad take a job for a year in France, um, because we come from the States, obviously. Uh, it took a year in France, the year I was seven, and so I was dragged around to various chateaux and forests and things, and it was such a different life from the one that I had been living in a little suburb of Cleveland, Ohio, but they looked like the fairy tales. And 
the you know tapestries on the walls looked like the fairy tales. And I had this sort of sense that I could push through to that, partly mm -hmm. through history. Mm -hmm. um, and so historical novels were also very interesting to me. And those in their own way are a way of creating a world. The past is another country, they do things exactly. differently. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, not only that, but that you have to recreate it for mm -hmm. your reader because you can't assume your reader knows what mm -hmm. you know. No, I think that's, yeah, that's really, yeah, I mean, I think some, uh, there's a sense sometimes that world building only happens when you're making the wholly independent secondary world, but I think that's really interesting talking about sort of fairy tales and the narratives where people travel into other worlds also require the building of those worlds. I guess that's, that's that sort of interesting rena relationality that's always there. I guess I can lead on for that by asking a little bit about what you, what you bring from your other parts of your background as well as being writers into those worlds. You've talked about games already, Adrian, but I wondered um, whether you would see your background in zoology feeding into the particular kinds of world, but, <laughs> and particularly with the new series, whether your long work as, long period working in law has, in, has influenced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's one of those, so law tends to get a very short shrift in fantasy and science fiction. Lawyers are usually bad guys. And so I have, I am trying to kind of redeem the profession in the genre by doing heroic lawyers, like, um, as in uh, with the Final Architecture mm. series. And, um, possibly I'm backsliding a bit with the, the current fantasy work because the law, the legal side of things tends to turn up mostly in human dealing with demons mm -hmm. and the contractual relationships with demons and what goes wrong if you get the wording in the contract wrong mm -hmm. and things like that. But yeah, I, I think it's just, it's not so much me being terribly erudite about law or having anything interesting to say about law so much as me making a lot of in-jokes that other lawyers might get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But also, I guess, that you're I mean, filling a gap in some ways in world building in general, that often the law is there as a capital L magical law, but the legal infrastructure mm. is not so much there. So in your particular kind of world building, you're more interested in those kinds of social infrastructures, perhaps, than some... And also, you, law, I mean, law in fiction is almost always criminal law. Mm. It's just, ah, oh, someone has been murdered, there will be law. Whereas 95% <laughs> of law, both historically and in our world at the moment, it's people faffing about very small sums of money. Hmm. And it's just like... <laughs> and for some reason, that's underrepresented in fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to jump in and say that in my current novel, which I have just finished and sent off to my agent, which is another Riverside novel, there's huge... Uh, the whole plot has to ride on mm. really stupid legalities. Mm. And so I have, like, like, who owns a piece of property that had been abandoned for a very long time is one. And the other is, how are you legitimizing a member of the family mm. when you've lost the papers? And I have a good friend who is a Wall Street lawyer, and she's by my side at all times advising me on law things. And she, but she wants me to get it all right. Mm. And it, I kept saying, it would be really boring if I do it at the level that you're telling it to me. So again, as I did with, with uh, the first novel and in all of them, really, I'm just I'm going to pull this string here and I'm going to move this here and I'm going to create an ancient you know, uh, law that can override all this other stuff so that I, we can enjoy the book. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a, that's a key thing with world, with world building. That There's only so much of this you can read. <laughs> yeah. Um, but sort of that, that phrase, right enough, is really interesting because I guess mm. there's one sort of model of world building that says you have to know how everything in the world works before you can begin. There are certain people who really like writing in that style. I guess Tolkien is a key, is a key example of someone who needed to know the history of everything or had that long history behind him when he started. But there are other writers where you hear sort of in interviews sort of say, where they're asked, what do you know beyond what's on the page? The, as little as possible. In some ways, the, create, the world is created for... The story. So I was wondering, with this, with sort of law, is it, the, it sounds like there's a, it's sort of this far but no further in terms of. You know, it's smoke and mirrors. All mm. art is illusion, and mm. all I need to give you is the illusion mm. that I mean, and the, the benevolent illusion that it's real and realistic. Mm. Um, you just have to trust me and love what you're reading enough uh, to, to go with it. That's what you want. Readers don't want to be unhappy. Readers want to be happy, and it's our job to make you happy. So it's not even so... And, and also, I have to say, I'm, I loved... I was young and impressionable. I hadn't even published yet when I read that Le Guin interview where she said, when you, when you own a world, when it's your world, especially if you return to it the way she did to Earthsea, you just know things, mm -hmm. you know? And it's the rush, wash, tea... Mm. Quote, do you guys remember this? Or it's where, where she says, she, she says, for instance, um, you know, if you ask me what the, the 
women drink while they're weaving on such and such an island, it's rush wash tea. Now, I did not know that a moment ago. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, that's also, I'm a very intuitive uh, world builder. And mm. fortunately, I, and this is the question you were asking before, mm. I have a big, big basket, uh, that's not a good metaphor, a big thing, <laughs> a cauldron to, to draw from that I try to give myself as many life experiences as I, as I can. I travel a lot. I mean, not so that I'll be a better novelist, but it sort of cause and effect. It, it worked out that way. Um, and, and read a lot in my case of, of history. Um, I just, I have a lot of places that I can draw from and, and they're there for me when I need them. And if they're not, I have friends. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've, got, I've got two very different kind of metaphors to draw on here. So one of which is being in a fog and one of which is the folding of proteins. Mm. <laughs> Bear, so, stay with me. So <laughs> pro, proteins work because they are a particular shape. And they are that particular shape because of the charges of their molecules. They kind of crinkle into a particular configuration. Building a world is a bit like that. You work out what the charges of the molecules are you don't need to know all the little folds and things because as you look at the molecule, they will become very apparent to you. So that fine level of detail, uh, I mean, yes, you, know, you do get writers like Tolkien who hammer out those details because those are the very specific things like the linguistic details that he's interested in. But a lot of the time, as long as you kind of know that skeleton, that shape, and so you get the fog. You get the idea, right, I can see the things that are immediately around me. But beyond that, you get the shadows. You kind of know, right, there are big buildings over there. And over there, the country levels out, and you can see it's going down to water. But that means that when the book pulls you in that direction, even if quite unexpectedly, you kind of know what to, what you, what to expect. So you, you know the name of the tea, even if you never had to th think about it, because all of the things you've thought about in the world have kind of pulled you in that direction. And that really is intuitive, intuitive and imaginative mm. world building, which I think kind of gets, gets a little bit of a short shrift these days um, and shouldn't. So I'm really glad to hear you say that. Mm. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I think that's often one of the things that blocks people who want to write fantasies. They think they need to know everything before they start. And for certain writers, that might be true. But for a lot of writers, that's going to be completely yeah. disabling as a thing. I mean, one, one, thing, one thing I will say, though, is usually when I'm working out my, the basis for the world, there's a lot of stuff I do know about the world that doesn't get as far mm. as the page. And in fact, I mean, like writing about a lot of things, often the technique is you try and write as little as possible about what you know about mm -hmm. what's going on, because otherwise, like the law, it gets very turgid and very cluttered and very sort of ploddy to, to get through. It's very much the same with writing a sword fight. Mm -hmm. You want as little of the stuff you know about yeah. sword fights in there because otherwise the sword fight never really happens yeah. for all the mm -hmm. techniques you're talking about. Um, and, but I, I feel it's enormously useful as a writer of, of my particular style to know a lot about the world that isn't necessarily immediately useful for the story purely because you get... A, you get to make little offhand remarks about stuff that fits in the world perfectly, but that you never have to explain, but makes the world feel very real. But also, as a reader and as a writer, I like to feel that the world goes on beyond the book. I like to make people feel yeah. that the world goes on beyond but the book. I, I think it is absolutely, yeah, and there are, you know, if you can do it without necessarily knowing all of that extra stuff, that's really very useful. But for me, I tend mm -hmm. to feel I need to have kind of walked beyond the circumference of the events to get a sense of the ground. I was tripped up by the heels by knowing too much once. Mm. Uh, because I continue to write in the same world, um, and I, of course, find it really interesting to see, as in my own life, how does a city change uh, over the course of five years, over the course of 10 years, over the course of 20 years, in subtle little ways that we, as we look back at history, for instance, think 18th century, all one outfit. You know? and, and of course, you know, every other year there would be a complete change of style if you were living there and you'd think, like, oh, not those cuffs. But we're not, of course, aware of, of that, that amount of nuance. So I like to write a um, pre-industrial society where I can show you through the way that the people see it how things have changed and how well, we didn't have that. Uh, because it really, it really was uh, true. There's a wonderful um, book, uh, John, John Stowe's Survey of London. Oh, yes. 1586, something like that, in which he talks about how everyone rides in carriages now and people whose 
of parents would have been very happy to walk a foot, to go a foot, mm. <laughs> are now riding in carriages. You know, big, big change from 1560 <laughs> to 1580, you know, who knew? So this has always been going on. It's probably happening faster now with technology and all, but, but people are very aware of the changes in their own worlds. So anyway, I stick with my world and I love, I, I'm an achronological writer. Uh, so, mm. and I'm kind of following the fortunes of one family uh, in it and, so I will write extra short stories just to fill in bits. And I had written one that, that fell in between, I was trying to write one that fell in between two books. And I had, there was all sorts of information that I needed to give you uh, to make the thing make sense because it kind of included a recap of the first book. And I was trying to leave out the spoilers. And I, I, was, I was going mad, I couldn't get the story to work. It was deadly, deadly. And all I wanted was to get to one fabulous emotional point. <laughs> and I just, it was overdue to my editor, and I was miserable, and my fabulous wife, Delia, um, read it and said, just calm down. Imagine you're writing a real historical short story uh, about the French Revolution. You know, you don't need to point out that Danton and Robespierre had dinner together <laughs> in order to talk about you know, whatever, just, just treat it like a real historical and just zero in on the really important bits. And that was a revelation to me. Mm. And realizing, too, that I was overburdened with, with knowledge and needed to clear it out of the way. Yeah, and I think that's a, it's a tricky thing, knowing, knowing when to, well, when the sort of knowing when to start and knowing when to stop, I guess. Mm. Um, Adrian, you dodged my question about zoology. Tell me about spiders. Oh, well... <laughs> So it's a tricky thing. So it, I mean, I do. I write fantasy and I write science fiction, and I do have something of a different process mm. for the two. So most of my zoology stuff tends to turn up in the in the science fiction mm. because at that point I've got a left wall mm. to what I can create based on you know current understanding of whatever scientific areas I'm I'm dealing with. Um, so when I'm writing fantasy, I tend to I tend to cut a bit wild, but I still I mean, at that point the spiders element is it comes down to that basic, I really like spiders mm. and <laughs> insects and, I mean, in the case of City of Last Chances in the current series, an enormous centipede mm. that, that murders people and mm. that kind of thing. And I just like, these things are very aesthetically pleasing to me and I'm aware that they're profoundly discomforting to mm. a lot of other people and mm. both of these things can work at the same time in the book. Mm. And so... I guess it, com it comes down to that... that off, I guess that off-maligned um, area of, well, how does your fantasy world work? Mm. Which is something that a lot of writers do not, very wisely, I feel, necessarily engage with because you don't necessarily need it to work. You need it, to, like you say, to, to appear to work. You need it to be the swan on top of the water and you don't need to worry about what the legs are doing underneath. Um, I, tend to, I tend to be more in the camp of, I kind of need to know how things work, because that means I know what will happen when th unexpected things turn up. And so I then need to know, well, how much am I importing of real-world biology or physics or anything like that, which is frequently as little as possible. Mm. Uh, but it also comes, I mean, you also get it when we're talking about sort of semi-historical fantasy stuff. Mm. You tell, well, how much am I importing of the actual historical setting? And the, rule, the, the rules really work in, in very similar ways, is you kind of need to know how much you're letting the, the history or the science of it whatever, or whatever go out of focus so that you can fit the fantastical elements in. Mm. Yeah, and I guess that's, I mean, Alan was talking earlier about leaving space, and I think that's a space for, that space for readers, like, is a really interesting thing to think about in terms of world building. Because in some ways, like, if you, if you do not say that something is different, then certain kinds of default assumptions get brought in so you're a sort of in some ways there's always this sort of complex process of tweaking like there's a lovely Frederick Jameson essay about Le Guin where he argues that what she does is world reduction not world building she picks something ah. super interesting to focus on so gender in the left hand of darkness or the idea of an anarchist state and she strips out all the stuff mm -hmm. in the world ah. which she does not need to talk about that and makes a world where that's the main focus for the story space so I think that that sense that in that in some ways world building can be this enormously expansive thing but can also be this like really tightly focused thing again like using Le Guin as an example I think the, the ones who walk away from Amalus is an amazing feat of world building in about 3,000 words or something along those lines I guess I can I will stop rambling and turn I put this into a question um <laughs> is this 
Does, how does, do you, is your process in terms of thinking about worlds change when you're writing something sort of across 10 volumes like Shadows of the Apt or something like in a sort of thing, more short novel, novel or novella length like Elder Race or Spiderlight? Um, I mean, I guess a little, but maybe not as much as you think mm. because I, I always, I still always need to have, feel I've got, my, I've got my feet on some sort of firm ground as far mm. as a place that feels real, a place mm. that is lived in by real mm. people. And so even when I'm writing, say, just a novella length with Elder Race, that world, there is a lot of stuff, a lot of thought I put into that planet um, and the past history of that planet that has led to this peculiar sort of post-tech civilization mm. arising there that doesn't come up at all in the book, mm. but I still feel I need to do it and I need to build that foundation mm. so that I'm comfortable with it. And I will probably, in a longer series or in a longer book, get to explore more of that and I'll go more places, and there'll be bits that are just very vague ideas in my head which will get explored in more detail, but I'm kind of, I'm starting at the same, I'm starting with the same kind of procedure. It just gets, gets abridged a lot when I'm in a novella that I know I'm only really going to be exploring the one idea. Mm. Yeah, no, that's sort of, it, it, it's intimidating to think behind those 50 books there are even more books, <laughs> box files thought out, um, but... Um, Ellen, I guess a similar question that I could ask you would be about Thomas the Rhymer, where you've moved from, you've said you spend a lot of your writing life in Riverside in this one fantasy world, but that's a book that has both the, a historical world and then the fairyland within it. Is, was that a very different process to writing Riverside books? Oh, very. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was funny. Riverside was the first one I wrote, and yeah. I thought, well, that's done. I, I will now move on to write yeah. other books. Never expected <laughs> to go back. Um, so the next book that I wrote was Thomas the Rhymer, based on a British uh, folk ballad, and every single thing in it is, is not stuff I made up. It's all from folklore, because that was one of my great, great passions, folklore and balladry growing up, and, and still is. So all my love for that went into Thomas, and I realized later there's no music in Swords Point. Mm. There's one joke about a pipe organ, sort of a body <laughs> joke about a pipe organ. There's literally no, no one sings. There's no music in that world. Yet, it comes in later. Uh, and so Thomas was, I just took all the music and, and gave it all to that book. The, the protagonist is, um, is a harpist and a singer and a performer. So a very different side of things. Um, and it's funny because I really, there's virtually nothing in the bit about Elfland that doesn't, someone else made it up hundreds of years ago. It's, it's all folklore. And I love it when I get credit for having made it up. <laughs> well, I mean, I, of course, immediately correct people. Like, oh, what a wonderful world. You mean, I'm like, <clears throat> oh, yes, well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, but the par other part of it is also an invented world. Um, I, I've thought about this, that, that the parts of it that take place in, our world in vaguely the time of a possibly historic minstrel and seer named Thomas the Rhymer, I set them in bookland mm. rather than in a real medieval world. And I don't know if I did it out of laziness, sloppiness, or just the sense that that was what I wanted it to be. Mm. Um, you know, there's the lovable old shepherd couple and the feisty young girl, and there's really nothing going on in that world much, except for, you know, a young guy who's a singer trying to get famous and have girls like him. Mm. Um, and I remember my, my wonderful editor, David Hartwell, uh, giving it a read, and just and he had a PhD in medieval studies, which he always wanted to make sure you knew about. Mm. And in his editorial notes, he said, well, what about monks? Like, there are no monks. This is not a book that requires monks. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, there probably are monks somewhere. And in fact, I think in the in a rewrite, I ended up mentioning them. But but we don't need that in this book. And uh, you know, you and I both know there are monks. But now, <laughs> the the other thing that I did actually was was to dedicate the book to. Um, my four grandparents, all of whom were Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe, and the Jews of York, who were locked in a tower and had it set on fire in a very celebrated event in 1190, as my way of paying tribute to the fact that I knew that while I was enjoying myself with this beautiful, invented 12th century world, you know, things had happened that would not have been so benign. Uh, so really, even the, the, the our world framing device is an invented world. Mm. But I think even in, um, in, in, the act, in the actual um, medieval period, when people are writing those early romances, 
that are purporting to take place in particular places and times. They are absolutely doing exactly that. They are presenting this sort of mythologized, yes, yeah, there were dragons and there were giants and there were knights and there is this kingdom that probably didn't exist and there is this kingdom that, that you yeah, there was a place of that name but it was nothing like this. And I, that it seems to be a, 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 an absolutely sort of instinctive way of approaching writing a story is right. I am going to start setting the parameters. I will set the parameters that will let me tell the story I want to tell. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, sort of sketching out a story space, which is mm. like the world, but not exactly of the world. I think, I mean, that's, I guess, true of, like, the writing. We, would, we sometimes think of realism as straightforwardly reflecting the world, but in fact, it's using all sorts of prisms and mirrors and lighting effects to make it look like the world. No one talks like they talk in novels, um, but, we, <laughs> we, uh, but we've internalised that as a way, as a, as a realistic reflection and similarly like lots of ostensibly realist novels spend a, a lot of time running away with metaphors inside mm -hmm. inside characters heads uh, when i try to explain mm -hmm. fantasy to people who don't read it and don't like mm -hmm. it and think that we just make up a bunch of shit mm. I, I say well you know if you're setting it in the real world if you're doing domestic realism as i call it you don't have to explain somebody goes to a subway and puts a token in and you know drinks a soda pop or something like that. And we have to set that all up for you. Um, so you're like 18 steps ahead of us in terms of bringing people into the story and, and we have to create it, but we have to make it feel just, mm. as, just as real. But then I guess... Why do we do this? Why do we do this? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think I know, but... I assume, so, so you're saying they're lazy then? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying they don't... <laughs> they don't. They do not feel the need to challenge themselves. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> it's it's a different aesthetic. Is the real mm. God's truth, you know? Mm. Yeah, I guess in some ways you've got the kinds as you were talking about Thomas Rhyme, You've got this sort of superstructure of traditions and ideas to draw on in fantasy that you can twist and develop. So you're not starting well, necessarily. That's true. Yeah, you're right. In fact, the, the, the real world frame with the lovable old couple is meant to uh, seduce you, the reader, into a false sense of security, or really to give the, the character, the troubled character at its heart, a genuine sense of security, that this is a place of safety. And it's very easy to transmit that through the lovable old shepherd and his wife. Hmm. Yeah, so I think, I mean, there's a diff there are different sets of challenges in fantasy, but there's, I mean, and a different tradition. In some ways, an, an older tradition. I think mm. literary realism, in many ways, is pretty recent as a kind of aesthetic. Um, a kind of mythic stories have, have longer and deeper roots. But there's, there's always this interesting process of, of collaboration. Um, I wonder whether I could ask you each about times where you worked within another series, uh, sort of someone else's parameters. So, Adrian, you've written for uh, Warhammer 40,000 fiction, and Ellen, some of your earliest publications are Choose Your Own Adventure books. So I wonder whether you could talk a bit about that working with, um, or working to create worlds within the constraints of those formulas or the existing law established, or whether that was a thing that you really worried about, whether you were given free reign. Oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I mean, certainly when you're doing franchise writing, um, you are absolutely dancing to someone else's tune. Mm. Um, I mean, the, with the Warhammer universe, you have an advantage that it's a very big universe and you can usually find a corner of it that no one has particularly detailed, which is where I genu have generally gone with it. But it's someone else's property. So that's your left wall. Your left wall is all the stuff that they have determined about it that you cannot, even in fleeting mention, um, contradict. My favourite Warhammer editorial note was I had mentioned that you know, someone had come to a planet and it was a horrible planet and I mentioned, yes, it's not like those nice agricultural worlds that he's seen. And I got an editorial note saying, no, all of the planets in this universe are horrible. There are no nice planets. <laughs> so you've got to take that reference out. And it comes down to that detail, mostly because if you get contradictions, you can bet that your editor will get letters from the fans. Yes. complaining about it. So I was told there was only war in this <laughs> <Yes>. far future. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the Choose Your Own Adventures, which I did to um, uh, subsidize my writing my first novel, which took a very long time, it was great fun because, honestly, I, I w each one was uh, an adventure in a world that, except for one, already existed. So my first one was Robin Hood. I thought, who wouldn't want to have fun adventures with Robin Hood? So I did not have to make anything mm -hmm. up. However, morally, um, I wanted choices to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, repercussions. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I was told, no, 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 no. 
you have to just die randomly, and there have to be one third good endings, one third horrible endings, and one third neutral endings. So there wow. you are. Yeah, there, there went all my uh, my attempts to you know educate the youth in Edwardian values. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. But I actually another one of my big passions is theater, hmm. um, and so I enjoy collaborating with people. The the first big collaborative thing I did was Terry Windling's Border Town series, mm. also known as Elves on Motorbikes. Um, it was all about teen runaways on this boundary between um, you know, our world and the elfin world. And it was tremendous fun. It was like playing with your friends and going, I know, I know, let's have this. Um, so that was great fun, but it was also really restful, for me anyway, to have this editor who had created the world and was letting us play in it. Um, I knew she could stop me if I did anything wrong. Uh, and that was actually really restful and nice. And being able to go to somebody and go, well, is it okay if this happens? That was, was really quite nice. So then I did sort of the same thing not that long ago when um, a friend of mine started a serial, serial box, which was a weekly serial uh, stories. It's now called Realm. And he asked if we could do one in my Swords Point world. And there would be novellas that would be done kind of like HBO TV series, where there would be a, a novella that took you uh, 55 minutes to read and would continue. There'd be a plot arc throughout the, we did 13 episodes uh, in four seasons. We really did it. And I found people who I knew loved the, the books already and would have fun playing in my sandbox, but also would bring new things to it. So I got to be, you know, the person who said, oh, no, 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 you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> um, but it was fun because, and this is that, this is group world building because they could bring their passions and their interests and their skills to, uh, to my world and frankly, just give me stuff. <laughs> We had a whole plot that was about navigation. We had a whole plot about banking. You know, it was great. And also brought in a number of characters of color who hadn't been there before because we, we look, well, what are the worlds that these people are trading with? Why do they have chocolate when they live in essentially England and France? Um, you know, who brings the chocolate? So now I have all these extra characters and cultures that, have, uh, that are working their ways into the world as well. Um, and I'm all for that. I, there are people who wouldn't enjoy it, but I just loved it because I like to play. Hmm. Yeah, I guess that's one of the joys of world building, that like, it, can, it can stop very suddenly or it can go on forever, and it can bring in other people or it can be your own thing. That sort of I'll just add that the, the first time I did it with the Swords Point world was when I wrote um, The uh, Fall of the Kings with hmm. my now wife, Delia Sherman. We were living together and writing this book together, and she does very deep historical research for her historical fantasies. And um, the first thing she did, she was doing the university, and she was making it kind of Oxbridge. And I said, no, no, it's much more like the, the Paris of um, you know, Abelard and Eloise or the, the Italian uh, universities. And that kind of just stopped her momentarily, but then she got into it. And that was a big, like, no, 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 you absolutely have to start over and make it be like this. Um, but after that, she would just shout up the stairs, so Ellen, like, what do they do when they have to bury someone? And I would <laughs> think of something and call down to her. No, I think that's, yeah. And did, presumably you've had this experience when when gaming, but less so in writing? Or, uh, well, or so there is, um, with the Shadows of the App series, there is a collection of stories by a, a wide range of quite wonderful authors, um, all, all set in that world. And that was interesting, because I discovered from that that actually my knee-jerk reaction is quite controly mm. and not necessarily playing well with others, which I absolutely had to get past. Mm. And rather than saying, oh, yes, I like that, but I would do it slightly differently. And just like, no, I just, it's great. I love it. Um, and so... I still, I think I have quite a prickly relationship with collaboration and mm -hmm. mostly I think because of my own kind of neuro, neuro plot and how my mind works, it's, I kind of need to know, I need to know my brief. Mm -hmm. I need to know what I can change and what I can't change and when I'm, when somebody is working in my world, I kind of need to set for myself limits, right, unless they are absolutely trampling on stuff that's already in the world, I need to kind of let them do that. And it doesn't come naturally, but it does, certainly does give you a much better result when you can. I want to ask you about that, because I'm thinking about how it really feels to be the writers and the creators of these worlds. I, I, is it a sense, just aesthetically, that it's wrong, sort of like, like you're there in your chemistry lab and, and they shouldn't mess with it, or is it 
a sense that the world really exists and shouldn't be changed? Um, so, for me, I, I tend to have a very, very real sense of the world's being places. Mm. Um, and so once I know a thing about a world, that is, that's kind of there. And, or at least it's there until I forget about it and write something contradictory in a later <laughs> book. Um, but I, ideally, that's then a thing, and I can refer back to it, and there can be things that play off it. Um, but it doesn't get directly contradicted unless I have a reason for actually, I, you thought it was like this, but in fact it's like this, um, which is obviously a, a way you can go about it. And there are other things like, so, so, and this is the thing I ran into with this collection, is people put something in and think, that doesn't quite feel like the way the world is going, but there is no particular reason why it shouldn't, and therefore, fine, I, that, I am going to step back and, and say, right, that's now how it was. But it, it did mean everything that goes in is then, right, that's another thing, a point in the map mm. that is then fixed, and that, that you know, there is now a new piece of knowledge about the world that I didn't have, but that, that is now canon. But, but you're going to move on anyway. Mm. You don't stay in that world. Well, I mean, I come back to them. I mean, Shadows of the Apt has, what, four, technically 17 books in that world. Okay. All told. <laughs> and I would like to go back to it at you some would? point. Mm. Okay. So it's a matter of, you know, it does come, become, as one gets older, it becomes much harder to, to remember all the small details that went into mm. it. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But I guess there are, like, sort of, Le Guin went away from Earthsea for a pretty long time and then and then came back and did something that was faithful to the original but changed mm -hmm. it quite considerably, that process of... So it's interesting to hear that you're thinking about returning to the world. Would you, I mean, would you be telling similar kinds of stories or would you be coming at it from something, a somewhat different angle? Do you um, have a sense of... I guess I would always try to vary it a bit. Mm. Um, and I would try and... I mean, what, when we were talking about the idea of the world mm. progressing and moving on and changing, which is mm. not a thing that fantasy fiction is necessarily very yeah, good at. It's funny, isn't it? Mm. But with The Shadows of the Apt, I always wanted that world which had that that arrow dynamic rather than the circular sort of restorative dynamic that you see in a lot of fantasy. Yeah. And so the idea, I wouldn't want to go back to anything, but I might want to say, right, it's 10 years later, what's happened? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, do we see any of the, the other characters around? Maybe, maybe not. Um, and I guess that also comes back to, because I'm interested in the world, not yeah. necessarily the characters I was writing about mm -hmm. in that way. I think we'll go to questions in a few minutes, so do begin to think. But I want to ask you first for some book recommendations. Can you tell me about some other writers' world building that you really admire, or that you, particularly people who, well, you can talk about like people who really influenced you, but if you, there, are, there are sort of current picks mm. for people who you think, wow, I've never seen anyone do quite that thing before that people should read. Um, well, on the basis that she isn't here to, yeah. To uh, talk about her own books, I would absolutely recommend both the fantasy and the science fiction of Aliette de Bodard. Mm. Um, there is, I was delighted to see House of Shattered Wings in the mm. exhibition um, next door. Uh, she is a world and universe builder par excellence in both in both sci-fi and fantasy modes. Uh, I I can't praise her too highly. I am overwhelmed by the genius of Francis Harding. Mm -hmm. I, she's, I guess, published more as a children's book writer here. She's barely known in America as much as she should be. But every freaking book is a new world. It's really complicated. It's really engaging. I, I just, it's like, is there a serum? And could I just have a little bit of that? <laughs> Extraordinary. Absolutely, yeah. I am, I am reading Deep Light at the moment. It's incredible. Right? Yeah. Um, I will also second um, the Elliot recommend, recommendation. I was I, I am responsible for the House of Shattered Wings being in that exhibition case because I think it's wonderful and I yeah I've enjoyed this the the new yearbooks as well. So do do check those out. I, I hope they are still outside. Any any other writers you would like to put pick up in terms of world building um, and recommend? I will recommend Nevo if you've not come across the wonderful novellas that she's been writing in the Singing Hills series. Um, uh, Empress of Salt and Fortune's done a trick I've never seen anyone else pull out so well. It's a pretty short novella, about 20,000 words. It does the whole world implied through this very particular set of relationships. I've never seen someone pull that trick off so beautifully. Um, I think the the Steel Tomb books, Towns of Muir, oh, yeah. mm, yeah. are a very good book. They are some of the most bonkers world books <laughs> you will ever come across, <laughs> written in a very, very rewardingly mm. complex style mm. 
so that you, you as the reader have to work quite hard to work out what is going on. There are a lot of games being played in those books, but they are extremely rewarding, and the audio books are very good as well. Mm. I'm behind in my reading. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Uh, should we take some audience questions? Um, we've got a question there, a question there, and a question there. We'll go to those three first, and then we'll come round. Please keep your questions to questions in about 30 seconds or something along those lines so we can take as many as possible. Um, hello, I just want to express my great appreciation um, considering the opportunity. Um, my question particularly is concerning uh, lexical artistry. My fascination potentially is with information. How do you balance the dichotomy between a want of knowledge exposition with a risk of purple prose? And what do you think is unique about fantasy subject matter, its quality and its meaning within conjoining reality to the realms of imagination and the potency of creativity within conjuring and conveying that message? <laughs> um, so, I mean, how I balance exposition with everything else is mostly badly, as <laughs> my, my editors will mm. usually tell you. Mm. Um, I think it's, act it's an enormously important part of the art form, is working out how much of the stuff you know, whether it is factual knowledge or just knowledge about your world, that you can get rid of to make mm. the text as lean as possible. Mm. Because it's a, it's a balancing act. If you take out too much, people don't understand what's going on. If you leave in too much, it can be very, very sort of hedonistic and luxurious, but also nothing ever happens in the book because you never get round to it. Mm. I guess partly the answer here could just be editing in some ways, that you don't have to leave things, you don't have to leave things in the first form that they come across. It's, that's, the, that's part of the tricky balance. Sorry, Ellen, go ahead. No, no I'm, I'm, mm. I'm not. I, you have made mm. a good answer. <laughs> uh, question here. Hi, um, I was brought up on a really odd mixture of Enid Blyton faraway tales and um, Star Trek. So <laughs> it took me, I mean, it's really recently that I've realized that there is a big split between science fiction and fantasy. And I just wondered what your take on that is, where you think the split is. Is there really a split? Is it overlap? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, a lot of writers will give you very different ideas, uh, answers to this. Um, many of them will say that for them there is no real difference. Mm. I tend to find I need to know where I am, but it's not a split so much as a spectrum. Mm. So, you have got complete, the f complete free creation of secondary world fantasy at one end. You have the very, very hard science fiction where you're absolutely trammelled in by all of the, the science that exists in that field on the other. And in the middle, you've got sort of a space opera sort of space where... You tend to have a lot of the trappings of science fiction, but you're not necessarily limited in the same way. And it's, I need to know where, where my slider is mm. for a given book. Um, but there isn't a hard line. And mm. Elder Race, which you mentioned, is mm. a book which I hopefully is simultaneously an epic fantasy novel and also a hard science fiction novel, depending on which of the protagonists you're following at any given time. And a really weird novel in the third, <laughs> in the third sort of sense. There. Yes, also possibly that, a cosmic yeah. horror novel. But, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, putting my lecture out on it, there's a really useful uh, idea from the fantasy critic called Brian Atterbury, which is this idea that fantasy is a fuzzy set rather than a hard set in which something either is fantasy or is not fantasy. And I think this leans into your spectrum idea that for him, something like Lord of the Rings at the centre of the fuzzy set of fantasy, but you would include Dracula in the set of fantasy, you would include quite a lot of science fiction and those sorts of things. And I, so I think if you think of them as sets that cross over in various points, that's a more useful way. And I think that that's the way that their genre communities operate as well, that you often get fantasy and science fiction conventions. Sometimes the fantasy people will be like, this one's a bit science fiction for me. Sometimes the science fiction people will read, what are all these elves doing? But usually they can... <laughs> Usually those communities can rub along, because I, I think they share that kind of broader, fantastic sense that you're creating another world. It's just like, how, 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 how ferocious do you like your rules, and what sorts of, mm. what sorts of colours do you like in your picture? There are surprising numbers of space elves, I will yeah, say. There are a lot of space <laughs> See, elves. See, okay, you know, some of that is historical. Um, <laughs> I would like to say that some of it is purely aesthetic. Mm. Um, it doesn't even really have to do with the content. For instance, uh, my first novel, Swords Point, has zero magic in it, and, but it's got a lot of cloaks and swords, and it's in a made-up world. Uh, but there's no magic. And um, it was very hard to sell as a result because it was not adhering to the, um, the 
standards of fantasy at the time, and therefore was this huge cause celebre. Now there's tons and tons of what they call historical fantasy, but at the time there wasn't much. In the generation before me, there was an enormous amount of fantasy, but fantasy wasn't a genre, and so they put it on a planet. <laughs> and this was called Sword and Planet. Mm -hmm. And if you were to read them now, you'd be like, what's with this planet? This is clearly an invented world <laughs> fantasy. But it was really, it was a marketing uh, uh, question, and just mm -hmm. a question of what people were used to and what they were expecting. And what would sell. And what would sell, yeah. Mark. I think there was a question there. I will then come across to this side because we've been neglecting this side of the room. And then there's another question towards the back. I think I spotted. John, I do not have a clock with me, so you must warn me when we are running short of time. Oh, okay. I oh, wait, wait. I have, an, I have a final answer. There's a, there's a quote, I don't know who it's from, who says, um, science fiction is a place that you can get to eventually if you live long enough, and fantasy is a place you will never get. Mm. Or takes place in a place. Mm -hmm. Hi, yeah, so obviously, um, Ellen, you kind of talked about more sort of following your characters around as a writing style as opposed to building the world up. Um, when you are kind of building the world up, how do you keep things straight? Do you have any particular ways? Obviously, you've written 17 novels in the same world. <laughs> have you got tri tips and tricks for how to keep things straight or how you prefer, or is it all just in your head? Your first I haven't written 17 novels, it's your <laughs> question. Um, I mean, when I was a younger writer, I could keep a lot of it in my head, and now I make copious notes, uh, because otherwise I find that the thing I called that thing in the book changes from chapter to chapter, or people's <laughs> manners of speech or terms of address and things like that. So it, it, I mean, it's often, and it's often, it's little markers like that. It's just like, if you're from this culture, what, what is the sort of the polite way you would refer to someone? And I have to write those things down now, and I tend to have large self-made glossaries but it's literally it's just those little details much in the same way that I think you do if you're writing in a set historical period those are the things that you would really need to know that would be quite hard to research because they're not necessarily the thing that historians are ever writing about but you need to know you know how people ate and how people got information from one place to another and and you know, did you travel, and if you traveled, how you, how you would do it, and when you would do it, and these, you know, the little tiny living details uh, are the things I tend to need to write down. The big stuff about the world tends to still fit in my head. <laughs> did you, um, cause Next question. No, I, I, <laughs> okay, let's take the question, I think, I think there and then there, and then we'll go back across to the other side where there was one. Hi. I was wondering how you approach starting something completely new, building a completely new world. How, what's the first thing you do? Uh, both of you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to? I, I feel the necessity for it. Is this a story I can tell with something that already exists? And if not, what, what do I need? And then just look around. I mean, for me, a lot of my ideas are what-if ideas. And if you've got a new what-if idea, it's almost never going to fit in an existing world because that what-if has already kind of been and gone. Um, so I will start off... Um, the way I tend to visualise it is it's like dropping a rock into a pond. You take your, your, the big thing you want to write about, you drop it in, and then you just see where all the ripples go. And those ripples will organically create the world building out from that initial mm. concept as far as you need them to go. And then you can always just keep watching them if you need to go a bit further late, later on. But that kind of process that where your central idea builds details that build detail that build details, it means ideally the world you get that you are about to start writing in is absolutely internally consistent in a way that means... Firstly, wherever your characters go, you kind of know what they're going to run into, like the tea that we were talking about. Also, it means that ideally your first draft does not need a vast amount of editing. Mm. I, I really like the pond and rippling thing because the thing that people who don't read and write fantasy always get wrong is this notion that it doesn't need to really make sense. Whereas uh, fantasy requires absolute logic. Um, less in magic systems where there's the numinous as, as in the world building. You have to have absolute logic and the minute you drop that, you've lost, it's gone. Hmm. Yeah, and no, I think that's, I, I agree that that's often something that people who don't read much fantasy think it's just like, it's just one strange thing after another. No, it's to get people to believe the strange things, lots of the other stuff has to be incredibly rigorous. And really concrete, in. really mm. concrete. There has mm. to be a physicality, I mm. think, to your fantasy world. And that, that's something 
I would really recommend that people think about. It has to, it, all five senses need to be engaged or it's just words on paper. You had a question there, I think. Uh, hi. Um, much in the way that Adrian mentioned uh, tabletops very early on, I was wondering, are there uh, skills that you have honed in world building that you find yourself using in other aspects of your life rather than just your professional lives? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe you don't do anything. <laughs> just, just, just writing all day. <laughs> I think understanding people is, is a lot of it, and also understanding power. You can experiment. You can run experiments on that in your fiction, and if you're wise, you will you will take them into your actual life as well. You can do it in a safe place as a writer, hmm. and then you, you may need. I also really believe that we have we we contain the um, the the grains of who we're going to be all our lives in our fiction. When I, when I first wrote my first novel, which was Swords Point, there was a character I really didn't like because she was old and bossy and powerful. Mm. And I swear to God, I have turned into her. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I think I always had her in me and she just kind of, mm. I, I was writing myself in the future. I mean, for me, on a smaller level, I'm still very committed to tabletop gaming as um, <laughs> as a as a hobby. But and there is an interplay. It's a, it's a kind of a slightly fraught interplay because you have the control you need over a narrative to get it to a satisfactory ending, and then you have a game where you just cannot have that control without railroading your players, which nobody ever really likes. But a lot of the time, um, there's an emotional interplay. So you can write, you can write a scene, and you can get right there is an emotional feel to the scene. I want my players to be able to experience that. I want, to, I want to try and get them to a point where this is what's going on inside them. And similar to, similarly, you can get those out of a game. And you're right, I'm not going to be able to really duplicate the game in any way, but this feel, this sense of what has just happened, this sudden plunge or triumph or whatever, that would be a really good scene if I can capture it in a book. We're also in a very privileged position to be able to earn a living constantly learning new things. I mean, I'm talking about how I, I uh, ca carry with me and use all these things I already know, but sometimes I need to know something new. How does X, Y, or Z work? I do need to know a little about navigation or about ships or what have you. And I've, I found many, many adults, um, even those who read, really kind of stop learning new things because you don't need to, except in your very particular field of expertise. And we really are constantly being asked to find out things we didn't think we were interested in. And my recent search history involves things like Martin Luther and the hearing range of a frog. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think Pretty much in the same sentence, those came up. <laughs> Don't do this to me. <laughs> I think that's one of the really interesting political things that world building does. It, like, essentially, it's, it shows that you can imagine a world that could be different, and then there's always implicitly the question, should our world be more like or less like mm. that one that I've posited as the sort of alternative that lets me think through the current world. I think that's one of the wonderful things that, about reading really good fantasy and science fiction, that, like, that you get a chance to experiment being in another world for a while and think about how that feels. Do we have more questions? Uh, there was a question towards the back, but so I think that one was for a while, and then there and there. Hi. Um, I was just mainly going to ask, um, when you take, and this kind of more for Ellen, but feel free to answer as well, um, uh, when you're taking characters from mythology or when you're basing it in something that's like a s fairy tales or like stories that are f like more concrete, I guess, um, how do you go about making that character feel like your character and not just you know a type that you're just rewriting again and again and again? Because novels are the thing that don't do that. Because fairy tales and folklore, there's very little motivation. There's no internal narrative. <coughs> um, and so you get these stories that are pure plot. You know, the stepmother leads the children into the woods. And you go, what's going on? And the, this notion of psychological realism and psychological motivation is fairly new. 
uh, and therefore we get to apply the way we like to think about the world and the way we like to write about the world to these bizarre things that, that didn't have that. So it's a really fun fusion. If, it's, if you find that what you're doing is just recreating you know, a, a kind of superficial stereotype, I, I tell students, think about people you know and give a character one quality that somebody you know has. And you may find all of a sudden you'll break through that shell of I am writing a character and find I am writing a person. Oh, no, sorry, I've, I've got my... Three, two. <laughs> Did we have a question just there? Um, going back to tabletop RPGs and mm. how you've written your own, like, uh, write your own adventures and things like that, do you have any fond uh, or recommendations of, like, game systems that you kind of take from that you find feed into your writing and vice versa? Um, I mean, what I would say is I don't think the system matters for that. I think that it is down to the interplay of the people uh, and any game system is good. For that, so it's very much look, you know, whatever you're looking for in a game system, you can still get that level of uh, drama and experience and enjoyment from from the game. And I'm still doing. Let's pretend. I mean, that's really where it all comes from for <laughs> me. I've never gotten to the table system because I just want to like pretend to be other people, and it's called improv when you're an adult. But really, it's like <laughs> I'm going to be the princess, and you're going to be the gypsy, and you run away with me. You know, that's. That's fun. I, I wish we all still did that. And I guess LARPing is maybe as close as we can come to that. Mm. Uh, any more questions? Uh, just there. Hi. Um, yeah, thanks for today. It's been really fun. Um, I've got a ton of questions I would like to ask you both, but the, I think the thing I would like to know the most is when, you, when you're writing, do you, do you start... So do you, do you chapter by chapter, or do you map out everything? Do you know what's going to happen at the end when you begin? Or does it unfold as it develops? It um, depends on the book. <laughs> Good. That, that's my short answer. Cool. Um, and I did want to do another very quick one as well, which would be... <laughs> Wait. <laughs> okay. Um, when, when it comes to naming the places and building a world, like what, 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 what do you use to inspire the, the naming of places? So I guess this is probably more for you, Adrian. Um, It'll come out of the world, the, because I start with the world, and I have a, a solid sense of the world when I'm, when I'm writing. I will have a sense of what, the, what place names will sound like or what character names will sound like. Um, sometimes I will make notes, you know, you know, this sort of ending or that sort of ending or this sort of cultural influence or that. But in general, it will come out of my sense of how the world works, which is what I always start off with. You know it's a real kick is when you think you made something up and then you discover that it actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> in some culture at some point in history. We have another question down there, I think. Um, apologies to the guy who was out of my eye line and probably been looking for questions from. Did you want to elaborate at all on the on the sort of depends on the book? Can you can you tell us a book that no, was there? No, it really does. I mean, sometimes you begin with the knowledge. It, it's like what you're saying. You do a what if, mm. uh, and it all flows from the what if. Sometimes it flows from at the end. I want the following things to have happened. Mm. How am I going to get there? What's the journey that I have to make to to get people there? Um, and other times you you start with the question. Other times you start in what turns out to be the middle of the, the narrative and you have to figure out why, how did I get to this point and how on earth is it going to resolve? Um, I mean, one of the little secrets is that it takes a really long time to write. And as a result, you've thought through a bunch of stuff before necessarily you've written it, you know? I mean, you're, you're writing on chapter, I don't know, 18, but your brain has already gone to chapter 20. So it's not like only when you're writing do you ever know anything about what's going to happen. I and mean, what I would say is I have a long history of planning everything out except the very end of the book. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So I will have chapter by chapter, beat by beat, all set down, and then the trajectory of all of that will take tell me what the end of the book should be. Yeah. But with the recent fantasy stuff like City of Last mm -hmm. Chances, I have literally just done the world, got the characters, and then just followed them around mm -hmm. uh, because I wanted that interweaving mosaic of quite ordinary lives in this very extraordinary world. And that worked really well. I really enjoyed that. But it is kind of terrifying because you do not know how long the book is going to be or even whether it will ever end. 
<laughs> the other thing is that very often, by the time you've got to the end, things have shifted enough. I, I, I've never not rewritten a beginning, I don't think, because by the end, I mean, even the style can change a little bit. And, you're be and so your beginning must absolutely telegraph and demand the ending in order to be a satisfying read, right? The beginning sets up something that people are going to want that has been resolved by the end. And so very often, do not waste your time rewriting a beginning over and over again. It is a fool's errand. Get to the end, and then you'll know what the beginning is. Hi. Uh, do you uh, believe that, um, as it's gone on, fantasy and sci-fi, to an extent, has changed so that it gives you much more ability to explore different things that you wouldn't have been able to explore in fantasy or sci-fi 30 years ago? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think one of the big, uh, one of the really big things is that we have a pool of writers now who are phenomenally more diverse in mm. viewpoint than we would have had 30 years ago. 20 years ago even, oh, yeah. and that can only be for the good of the genre, because yeah, we're a genre that thrives on imagination, and we're a genre that thrives on a breadth of ideas, and the more people you have coming from different uh, viewpoints, different places, um, different, um, different sexualities, different eth ethnic groups, the the broader a range of interesting ideas you're going to get. And we are all contemporary people writing contemporary novels. Our fantasy and science fiction are contemporary novels. And therefore, what society is interested in discussing becomes what we are usually interested in and certainly able to discuss. So they, they march hand in hand. Yeah, I think the feedback loop is also different to when it was when the people who are enfranchised or in some ways the people who go to conventions. Now you have that online communication. And you were talking about that increased diversity that's also been driven by fandom and debates like Race Fair, where yeah. it was highlighted very much that there were serious problems in representation and trying to see into its credit the field just did to a large extent uh, correct. I also think that the kinds of stories that are being told in fan works and in new forms show that there are other shapes that fantasy stories can take. I don't think you get Travis Baldry's Legends and Lattes until you have coffee shop AUs. And similarly, I think there's also a really, there's also this appetite for the really long fantasy narratives. So things like um, Wild Bow's Worm or Critical Role series or those kinds of things. So I think the shapes you can tell stories in are changing and that will, it's interesting to see how that will feed into fiction. Maybe in some cases, not very much because fiction's already learned what fiction is really good at doing, but there's definitely space for different short story shapes and story kinds. Um, we have time for one or two more questions, I think. So one there, one there, and then this one here, if we have time. I think we can fit those three, so. Short answers, short answers. <laughs> That's up to you. Short questions is up to them. <laughs> hey, in the interest of keeping it short then, uh, when you're creating a new world, how do you make the determination that your world is fleshed out enough to start telling stories in? Mm. I, I mean, I'm terrible at this because I will go way further than it necessarily needs mm. because I just really enjoy the world creation element. But they w <clears throat> I guess I will get to a point where I can write the first chapter and all the details I need for the first chapter are set out, and at that part of the world is in sharp focus, even if the rest is in the fog. And at that point, I know I can start, whether I will necessarily start, I don't know. <laughs> I pass. <laughs> okay, so a question there. Uh, as a general rule in, in fantasy, most political systems are autocracies, either benign or uh, vicious. Is that because it's just easier to imagine autocratic societies? That just in history there'd be many more autocratic societies than democratic ones, or that autocratic societies just make for better stories? I don't know. <laughs> I think that's a different panel. <laughs> I mean, I would, so I, I I think it's a bit of a curse. It's one of the things I would like to see challenged more mm. in fantasy. Uh, I don't think there is a particularly reason you get a better story out of autocracies. I think you can get a much more interesting story out of the Republic of Venice than you can necessarily uh, yeah. the Holy Roman Empire. Um, I think that there is a tradition. Uh, so 
I think Tolkien is intentionally drawing on a mythic tradition of a time when autocracy was pretty much the only thing people were really able to imagine a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. Certainly that there was a very strong social pressure to make the only thing that was possible and the thing that was virtuous. You know, the king must return so the land can be well, all of that sort of thing. I don't think this is necessary and I think that giving autocracy a pass leads to some fantasy I tend to side-eye rather a lot. Hmm. Well, actually, when I when I started my my first one, Swords Point, it, it's not an autocracy. It's kind of like the Council of Venice, mm -hmm. and I just had a lot of fun blowing up all of these little things um, and and tried to make it clear on the first opening pages that everything you were expecting was now not going to be. Um, you know, it's still an aristocracy. It's not you know a happy democracy, but but at least that we were going to be moving away from the more traditional stuff. So it, it can be done, and yet you can still have cloaks and swords. Yeah, and, and I mean, and sh Shadows of the Apt, the, the main sort of benevolent culture is a, democ is a genuine democracy, and most of the examples of autocracy you see in that, in that world are either terrible or collapsing. And Nora Jemison plays a lot with this. N.K. Oh, Jemison yeah. plays a lot with this. I mean, it, to answer your other question, what can we do now that we couldn't do before? I mean, the other thing that's really important to know is that we are all in conversation with those who came before us with the books that we've already read. Uh, another person who really plays with the Narnia books and, and has his, you know, this question of are you in a world that you would like to live in or is this a world that should be like ours? Um, uh, Len... Um, Lev Grossman. Lev Grossman just... just just goes deep into his problems with Narnia. And uh, it's, a, it's quite shocking in some ways where he goes with that. Um, he's spoken about it very eloquently, but when you read them, he, he's really blowing up your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> Should we take our last question there? Um, and then. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think what I really find amazing about world building um, in fantasy is not only the, the world itself, but you know even the quote unquote human characters. You know how if, in really good world building, you know how they see the world so differently, really different assumptions, really different look at their place in society, and so on. So. I, I would just like to ask you, how do you actually put yourself in w what could be even an, a very alien sort of, and you know, with you, Adrian, it's you know, obviously sort of literal in that sense. How, how can you sort of put yourself in that frame of mind to be able to write characters in that way that really feed into that world building and make it real for us as the reader? It's fun. I'm not sure, I'm not sure I understand the question. So. I mean, it comes back to a lot of the, a lot of the, my answer to a lot of these questions is the same, is it's because the world. And once you have the world, the world tells you what the people are like. The world gives you almost like a lens or a pressure on those people that mean they come out differently to people that we know because of these assumptions. So, for example, um, in The Tiger and the Wolf, everyone in that world is a shape changer. And the difference this makes to their relationship with each other and religion and the natural world and all of these things all arises out of, out of those ripples from that stone. And it gives you characters who have f f occasionally end up going to places that really we would find horrific or shocking but which make perfect logical sense to them because it fits within their framework of the world but it comes because that world has a framework that makes that kind of consistent sense yeah, it's really fun in fact to, to mess with readers heads and make them <laughs> like something or accept something that they wouldn't accept in the real world because the the context of the world you've made up is um, allows it or demands it Hmm. Or you can throw the book across the room, which is a completely <laughs> legitimate response. <laughs> well, I think we're at the end of our time. So if you would like to buy books to keep very carefully rather than throw across the room, <laughs> I think <laughs> both the copies of both Ellen and Adrian's works are outside. Can I just They're ask you to thank our wonderful panel? The brilliant. Thank you so much.